So thank you very much for uh, the introduction of myself. And I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, the organizer of this uh, conference. I really apologize for not be in person at the conference site. Um, so um, today I'm going to uh, present my talk focus on, on some mathematical modeling of a tumor, which is uh, actually, a, a, I'm going to talk about solid tumor. And it's not a homogeneous system, actually. And, and how we use a nano emission uh, to investigate how nanomaterials, um, how it can, um, how we can use nano emission to uh, investigate the biodistribution. Let me show you uh, my agenda for this talk. So I'm going to show you uh, to show you how uh, seldom is the use of mathematical mo uh, models in this area. And the second, I'm going to show a typical in vivo biodistribution data. Uh, next uh, will be a very simple map modeling and one compartment. And then uh, sophisticated a little bit more, uh, showing you how to model a, um, a certain number of compartments, semi compartments in, uh, in parallel and in series. And then uh, I'm going to show you some, uh, the experimental design of the, of the, uh, of the data. I'm going to show you today and how we perform the analysis of the data and finally my conclusions. So if you do a, 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 a little bit of search uh, in in vivo bioassay, like if you do this search in web of science, this search, I did it early this year, you will find more than one and a half million papers published in in vivo bioSA. However, only about 3% of those papers, <clears throat> sorry, you can find a, some uh, analysis using a mathematical model. So here is a, a, a very surprise uh, a small number of, of analysis, of mathematical analysis of the uh, in vivo biodiversity. And we can understand the challenge of transform a qualitative analysis to a quantitative analysis. Uh, although if you look at the last years or last two, three decades, the number of papers, uh, including a mathematical analysis, is growing up, not quite linearly, actually. It, it looks like a, some exponential trend uh, in, in increasing the number of papers and publications that include mathematical analysis. Uh, so it, it's, not, it's not hard to understand probably why uh, most of the papers up today are still uh, reporting their data without mathematical analysis. So if you look at the background of, of researchers working in this area, uh, of course, the uh, mathematical basis or background of these uh, people is not very much strong. So. And that may explain uh, the reduced number of, of papers which use a, any sort of mathematical analysis to understand their data. Uh, and then uh, typical 
in vivo biodistribution data is like this one. This is a recent publication indeed. And if you look, this is standard. If you look at the, um, let's say this experiment, what they did is uh, they use uh, zirconium 89, which is a radioactive uh, isotope. And then you can form, you can perform the, the PET data. You can scan, screen, uh, let's say the animal using uh, positron emission tomography. And then you see these are the typical data. So they just collect the data and they can, of course, make some uh, analysis, but still only a, a qualitative analysis. They may say, okay, uh, if we track uh, zirconium chloride in the animal, we can see that most of the particles they grow, they grow on, on the bone tissue, like the blue uh, data uh, in the screen. And they may say, okay, the maximum uh, or the maximum absorption of the, uh, this uh, particular material in the air, it goes up roughly about 45 minutes after uh, the animal be in contact with the, uh, uh, with the uh, nanoparticulate material. And then uh, you may say also, okay, uh, we can use zirconium in different materials to track. And the most, the most efficient is, uh, the ones we tested is about using zirconium chloride. So you can make, of course, statements about the data, but it is quite limited, the number of, of, of data you can extract from this. And also precision of the data is, is not very high. You may say something close to or more intense than, but not really, not really very, very much uh, uh, informative or in other, way, in other words, you are missing a lot of information if you just do a sort of qualitative analysis. Okay, here is a very uh, simple experiment. Uh, this was uh, published uh, more than two decades ago. So we did this experiment. What we did, we injected uh, nanoparticles of magnetite coated with dextran in the animal's tail and then we follow, it was what we call a bolus dose, a single dose in the animal's tail. And then we collect blood from the animal as a function of time after injection. And then we can track the concentration of the particles in the blood circulation as a function of time. So, you can see on the right hand side this plot, which is a similar plot of the concentration versus time. And the open circles here are the experimental data. And, and the solid line is the best fit of this data according to this equation. So the concentration of the nanoparticles in the blood circulation, it decays as a function of time and it decays exponentially. So how comes this conclusion actually? It comes from a very simple uh, differential equation you can solve easily. And this equation simply says that the rate, uh, the rate of the uh, uh, concentration of the nanoparticles in the blood, uh, it scales with the concentration in the blood. So, of course, it's negative because the rate is negative. And then you can transform this proportionality in uh, one uh, equality, just including a constant here. So easily you can solve this a uh, very simple differential equation is just to uh, trans translate CB, which is the concentration of the nanoparticles in the blood circulation, 
to the left hand side and DT on the other side. So you can integrate both sides. And finally, a very simple solution like this one. Although it's a very simple solution, you can fit the data, the experimental data, very nicely. And moreover, you can say that the half lifetime, the half lifetime of disposition of the uh, magnetic nanoparticles in the broad circulation is about 6.9 minutes. So if you look at the only the experimental data without any mathematical analysis, it's going to be very hard uh, to extract a, a very uh, informative uh, parameter like this one. And also the precision and that you can inform this parameter. Uh, in this particular case, how we track the concentration of nanoparticles. We use actually uh, ferromagnetic resonance to see the amount of magnetic nanoparticles in the blood sample collected from the animal. And here in the inset of the figure, you can see the calibration curve. It's a very important data. So if you want to do something quantitative, you have to have a calibration curve. And hopefully the calibration curve goes a linearly. So this is a very simple uh, demonstration of how you can uh, analyze a in vivo data. And it, it is related uh, with the uh, biodistribution of any nanomaterial injected in the animal. So, you can, of course, uh, you can um, investigate even further the, the biodistribution of the, of, of the, any injected, let's say, nanomaterials in animal. So, Let's say the same experiment as I showed you in the last uh, uh, in the last slide. However, you can collect data. Uh, you can collect the amount of nanomaterials as a function of time in different organs in the animal. So then you have the same strategy. So you have a tail injection of your nanomaterial. And there is a biodistribution in different compartments in the animal. So you know how is uh, the uh, time decay of the concentration of nanomaterials in the blood. And then you might, you might uh, search for uh, the concentration of the nanomaterial in different compartments. And this is what we call parallel, uh, a parallel model. So the nanomaterials just uh, goes from the blood circulation to different compartments in parallel. So the solution of the system now comprises a, a linear, uh, a, a number of, of different equations like this one. Uh, you have the concentration in, in, in the blood circulation, and then you have the concentration of each, each one of these compartments. So you have a set of different equations actually, and they are not very difficult to be solved. So, and here is a detail of the mathematical model for M uh, compartments in parallel. So typical parameters is, let's say, here is the C1 compartment, the first compartment, and any other particular compartment. So what you have is a transferring time, typical transferring time from the blood to a particular uh, compartment. So here is how the time, how the concentration of the uh, nanomaterial goes with time. And there is a typical, uh, a typical uh, residual time inside the compartment 
and there is this, a disposition with a typical transfer time outside the compartment. So solution of the concentration of the nanomaterial uh, inside any particular uh, compartment, actually it depends on three parameters actually, uh, besides the con initial concentration of the nanomaterial in the blood. So this is the concentration of the nanomaterial. You do the injection in the animal. So here you can see that uh, the time dependence of the concentration inside any particular, uh, uh, any particular uh, compartment, it depends on three constants actually. The typical time transferring from the blood to the, to the compartment, uh, the typical uh, residual time of the material inside the compartment, and finally, the typical exposition or uh, time uh, from this, uh, from any compartment. So, if you say, if you look at this uh, parameter J, I am actually J, I am depends on this constant I am, which is the ratio, the ratio between the typical transient time inside compartment uh, over the typical transferring time. So actually uh, to describe the time dependence of the concentration of one particular nanomaterial inside a compartment, you need, besides the concentration, the initial concentration in the bloodstream, you need also three typical time constants. Uh, so this typical time constants is the uh, transferring time from the blood inside a compartment, the transient time, and the Ex and, and the uh, exposition time of the banana material. Okay, so once you have uh, all this equation, once you have an equation like this, you can apply the same equation to any particular uh, organ or compartment, you are able to measure the concentration of that nanomaterial as a function of time. So the solution of this set of difference equation provides you all typical transferring time uh, going into the transient inside a compartment and the uh, exposition time of the nanomaterial. So here is a, a different alternative. So now the systems are not in parallel, but they are in series. So you have the bloodstream transferring material inside the first compartment, and then this first step, the material transferred to a second compartment in series. So you can check uh, this, uh, this is a different scenario, of course, this is a serious scenario, and then same way as before, you have constants that you can relate, uh, like for instance, a constant K and K uh, defines J, the J parameter is, is written in terms of K parameter, and the K parameter depends on the ratio between the transient time, C, this is the transient time in the first compartment, over the typical transferring time from the bloodstream to the first one. So you can see uh, uh, the K for the second and the K for the first compartment. So here we, I'm just looking at this uh, first step, which is a transfer from the blood to the first and then the first to the second compartment in series. So you can just calculate uh, the time dependence of the concentration in both compartments, the first and the second. And here are the equations. You can solve this problem. And again, you have for each step, you have the uh, 
uh, it depends on, on the initial concentration in the bloodstream, and also it depends on three different time constants. So you can fit your data once you have a way to experimentally uh, measure the concentration in each of these compartments as a function of time. So you can uh, fit the data using all these equations, then you can extract uh, the time constants related to each compartment. So let me show you now a one typical experiment we perform. So uh, here, um, we have a combination of one uh, organ which, which was in series to compartment for this first organ, which is a tumor, and then a parallel transferring to another organs. Actually, we follow two organs uh, besides the tumor. So the tumor is a parallel compartment uh, with respect to liver and lung. I'm going to show the data, but, but the tumor itself, it has two regions, like, like any kind of solid tumor. Here is a sketch of how behaves a solid tumor. In a solid tumor, uh, the region we call the periphery or the shell of tumor uh, is very different, the structure from, from the inner part of the tumor, the core of the tumor. So in a way that uh, transferring of material inside or to a tumor, you should analyze this in terms of two compartments in series. So you have the periphery, which is the equation uh, derived from a series transfer, and then the core, which is the second equation. On the other hand, you can take the other organs in parallel in our experiment that I'm going to show you, we took lung and liver. So, but anyway, this is, uh, those are equations for the parallel and those are equations for the series. So here is the experimental design that I want to show you the data in the analysis of that data. So what do we need? We made, uh, we use, uh, mice to perform the experiment, we injected uh, intraperitoneally uh, one uh, infrared dye and also infrared dye inside the nano emulsion. So we made experiments using a nano capsule or a nano emulsion and also the free dye injected. And we used two uh, animal models for tumor, the Ehrlich and for T1 tumors. And what we check, in both cases, we check the biodistribution, looked at the liver, lung, and also the tumor. So the tumor was, uh, was uh, in the back of the animal. And we did this for Ehrlich and the for T1 tumor. So we were able to follow uh, the nano material and also the free uh, infrared dye uh, in, in lung, liver, and also in the tumor. So what we did, how we did this, we just use it, use it, uh, the uh, fluorescence tomography, actually near infrared fluorescence tomography. The system we used was a Dirkin Elmer model MFT4000 to follow and to check the concentration of the uh, infrared dye as a function of time. So here are the data we collected from this experiment. Uh, if you look at the tumor as a single compartment, so for the Ehrlich uh, tumor, we were able to follow the nano emulsion 
in the animals that were injected nano emulsion, of course, which is uh, the red points here, the red data, and also in another group of animals, we use the free infrared dye. So we can see that the uh, nano formulation uh, as a function of time, we have a decay as a function of time. And for the free drug or the free near infrared dye, we have a, a, an increase and then a saturation. Same way or roughly the same trend we can see when we perform the same experiment in animals that were bearing uh, the 41 tumors. So here is uh, the nano emulsion decaying, the concentration decaying with time, and the free infrared uh, dye just slightly increasing as a function of time. Okay, if you uh, do your analysis only qualitative, you can say, okay, there is a trend, there is a trend, and reduction of the uh, nano emulsion as a function of time in both cases, and there is a trend in increasing uh, uh, concentration with the free uh, infrared dye as a function of time. However, you cannot say uh, any more than this. You cannot say uh, what is the typical time, what is the typical time of decaying, or is the typical time of, of increasing, and how much does it increase, how much does it decay, and what is the relationship between the typical time of increasing or decay time. So it's impossible to do this if you look at only qualitatively your data. However, as you can see here, the solid, uh, the solid lines, uh, they are results of uh, a curve feeding of the experimental data. Besides this, we can also analyze uh, uh, the, the, the nano emulsion data, uh, looking at this is the data for the whole tumor but then we can analyze in terms of the tumor structure. So looking at the data we can collect from the inner part of the tumor and also for the shell or the external part of the tumor, the periphery of the tumor. So if you, you can split this data experimentally actually. So if you do this, you can look at for, for the earliest tumor, this left side is for the earliest tumor, so you can see in the case of the nano emulsion in the tumor shell or the periphery is the red data and the tumor in the inner of the tumor is the blue data. So you can uh, also, you can fit the data using uh, equations for uh, compartments in series because uh, the core and periphery, they are in series. And also we can check uh, for the free, this is the free uh, data, is the, free, the data from the free uh, infrared dye. So you see in both cases, we can check uh, the tumor shell and the tumor core. And the trend, the trend is exactly the same trend, of course. And also the trend for the nano emotions, the same trend for both inner and uh, outer side of the tumor. Same way, so likewise, you can see, if you look at the data uh, you extract from the animals who were burying the 421 tumor. So all the data, so from all this data, you can extract very important parameters. So you can use the parameters to plan uh, ex uh, future experiments uh, in vivo uh, animals also, which is very much important. You, you can make a component between the group, then you can, uh, likely you can plan some protocols for real treatment. Okay.
So besides looking at the tumor, you can also look at the uh, biodistribution in different organs like in liver and lung. And you can follow the data. This is for the parallel model. So you can follow the data uh, for the nano emulsion, which is the red, and the blue is the free uh, infrared dye. So for the early and the liver and the lung, you can fit the data and say how much, what is the typical transferring time from the circulation different from the animal model and to the other animal model. So you can see the solid lines are the best fit for the data. So from all this collection of data and the parameters that you can extract from this data, you have a much better scenario. And also uh, you are much more confident about the conclusions you can extract from this experiment. So the big question is, what do we learn uh, when we apply a mathematical modeling to understand uh, biodistribution in, in individual experiments? So only looking at the field data. So when you compare the organs like liver and lung, and you can, you can easily see that this red, uh, data here, you can see that these are the typical disposition time from the liver and the lung. And you can see the typical exposition time are quite different. So in the case of lung, the typical disposition time is about 50% higher uh, than the typical disposition time from the liver. Okay, that's what the nanomaterial says. Not only the nanomaterial, the nano emulsion, but also the free infrared dye. So you can check both data. And then you see that the typical disposition time for the nano emulsion is much longer for the lungs, about 50%. And if you compare, uh, the typical disposition time for the nano emulsion in the free uh, infrared dye for the same uh, compartment, you can see that the uh, free disposition time, uh, the disposition time for the free uh, infrared dye is about three times uh, higher than the typical disposition time for the nano emulsion. It means the nano emulsion goes outside the body uh, much more quickly, much more uh, quicker than, than, than the free uh, infrared dye. So also, if you look at the tumor, which is very interesting data, you can see the typical, uh, now the typical uh, transferring time uh, from the uh, periphery to the core of the tumor. So this is periphery to core uh, transferring. And you can see that the tumors are quite different. If you compare uh, the 4T1 with the, uh, the 4T1 uh, between periphery and core, the typical transferring time are very small compared with the, uh, uh, between the 421 and early. So the tumor is quite different actually. The typical transferring time from periphery to core uh, in the early is very high compared to the typical transferring time from the uh, periphery to core for the 41, it's about three orders magnitude higher. So that happens, uh, that happens for uh, not only for periphery to core, but also it happens uh, for the typical disposition time. So this is the disposition time. And also you can see a three order magnitude higher so the typical disposition time for the nano emulsion. So uh, four to one compared to the early. 
So in terms of uh, tumor uh, characteristics, you can see how much different are 41 and early uh, tumor animal models in regard to not only to the transferring time from periphery to core, but also a disposition time. So if you have this data, of course, you can uh, plan future experiments or support uh, protocols when you transfer, uh, eventually when you transfer this technology to the human being and to perform, let's, let's say, phase one, phase one treatment, phase one, phase one analysis. So you have data that can help you to plan future experiments. So what, is, uh, what are the conclusions of, of this talk, mainly about what are, what are the benefits of using mathematical modeling? Although, although as, I, as I showed you in, in, in my first slide, although we have more than 90% of data published in the literature uh, using uh, biodistribution in, in in vivo experiments, they don't use mathematical modeling. So it's a huge it's a huge loss of information actually. So here are uh, actually quantitative analysis does provide extraction of typical disposition time and. So qualitative analysis never can do this. You cannot say what is the disposition time. And second, uh, quantitative analysis like this one provides you typical transferring time. So you have a, a, a very precise information of, of how much or how quick uh, the nanomaterial in the blood circulation uh, can be transferred to a, a biological compartment. Qualitative analysis, it doesn't. And quantitative analysis does provide extraction of a typical transient time. So how much a material or a nanomaterial stays in, inside a particular organ or compartment before it can be disposed and qualitative analysis, it doesn't, simply like this. Quantitative analysis allows to distinguish the influence of period to more time. So quantitative analysis uh, provide you with information of how different, different tumors are when, when you analyze uh, animal models for uh, tumor. So, and qualitative analysis does that. You, you cannot say uh, how different is one kind of tumor uh, with respect to the other one. So, I would like to, uh, to thank the organizers of this conference. And also, I would like to thank all of you uh, uh, watching my presentation. Thank you for, for, for being online. And, uh, or perhaps uh, in the auditorium in the screen. Thank you so much. So I'm ready to uh, take any uh, of questions uh, regarding my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.